Okay, well, welcome everyone. Thanks for being here today with us, um, either in person or virtually. I'm Annalise Riles. Uh, I'm Associate Provost for Global Affairs here at Northwestern, and I'm also our Fulbright Liaison Officer. And um, we're just thrilled today to have with us a representative of Fulbright who is going to share with us more about the program, as well as a distinguished panel of faculty and staff who are going to share their experiences of the program. Uh, for those of you who are online, uh, we will be monitoring questions. So please do go ahead and put questions in the chat and we will get to those. Okay, so first I'd like to introduce um, our guest of honor today, Aphrodita Krasnici, who is the Outreach and Recruitment Specialist for the Fulbright U.S. Scholar Program at the Institute for International Education. She manages the Fulbright Scholar Alumni Ambassador Program, leads initiatives with Fulbright Scholar Liaisons on U.S. campuses, and serves as the lead for Europe and the Eurasia region. Prior to this role, she served as an outreach and recruitment officer for Europe and Eurasia for five years and was responsible for the development and execution of key recruitment initiatives, including the Fulbright Scholar Outreach Partnerships. Aphrodita's background prior to joining IAE in 2017 includes working as a cultural exchanges advisor at the US Embassy in Kosovo for 17 years. She has a BA in English, language and literature, is a native speaker of Albanian and speaks fluent Serbian. And she's also a delightful person, I could say, after having lunch with her today. Um, um, Aphrodita is passionate about building bridges between people. And this marks her 22nd year of working with the Fulbright program. Thank you so much, Aphrodita, for joining us. And just wonder if you could say a few words about the program and give us some insight. Thank you so much, Annalise. Um, I hope you can hear me. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's been a delightful couple of days um, to be here at Northwestern University. And I want to thank, first of all, Annalise, and I want to thank Samantha and Anait for organizing this wonderful trip because, um, you know, we have been doing all of these on Zoom for the past two years. So we have a little bit of Zoom fatigue. <laughs> so I'm glad I'm here um, to present the Four by Two Scholar program in person. So um, like, um, let me just, I hope you can still hear me because I'm trying to, okay. All right, so I'm having some technical difficulties. I'm trying to move the slides. So um, just until, oh, okay, so we can use that, all right. Okay. All right. So thanks again for the kind introduction again, Annalise. And uh, so my name is Aphrodita Krasnich. I work as an outreach and recruitment specialist for IIE. I'm based in New York City. So um, it's an honor for me to be here, like I said earlier, and, and talk about the four bike program um, in person. So today we're going to talk about the program overview, and I promise I'll be short and quick um, and feel free to chat in the questions for those of us watching us on zoom because we will have some time hopefully to answer those questions but um, first of all just so you're familiar a little bit about the Fulbright US scholar program and what it takes to build together a strong application because I understand by now that there is a strong Fulbright US student program in the campus but uh, we want to make sure that we also get some Fulbright U.S. Scholar applicants from Northwestern University. And when we have some time, I'm going to show you also our website and how to navigate the website and also how to find out alumni of the Fulbright U.S. Scholar program, specifically from Northwestern University. So you see like the tradition of the Fulbright U.S. Scholar program in your campus. And then the eligibility is very important. First of all, um, we do get so many questions from applicants whether green card holders are eligible. Unfortunately, they are not eligible. You have to be a US citizen. So we're gonna dive deep into that later, but just so that in case anybody is in the audience and wondering if they can apply, they might have green cards and just so you know. But the minute you get your US citizenship, then you are eligible. I'm gonna talk about the types of the Fulbright U.S. Scholar Awards, because we have four different types. And I'm going to also talk about the timeline and when, you know, you should submit the application, when is the deadline, and all the moving parts. 
And in the end, we'll, we'll answer questions. So first of all, when you are considering applying for a Fulbright program, think about the mission of the program because uh, Fulbright is also looking for accomplished professionals and academics, as well as people who are going to serve as cultural ambassadors of the United States abroad. So for that, you need to be a person who is going to adjust well in the country you are planning to apply to, and you're going to serve as a bridge between that country and, and the US, between that host institution and Northwestern University. So think about that, how you're going to bring these two nations together through your Fulbright project, but also how you're going to serve as the cultural ambassador abroad. Then, you know, um, the other important um, historic uh, facts about the Fulbright program is that it was established 75 years ago. So it has a tradition and it, it is considered one of the largest uh, US uh, academic exchange programs. And um, we work closely with so many countries abroad, 130 countries, just for the Fulbright US Scholar Program. And uh, every country has like their different dynamics and priorities but we try to work with every country closely and you can only apply to one co country mostly for the Fulbright US Scholar Program. Sometimes we have multi-country awards, but those are very rare. So I encourage applicants to consider one country awards. It is sponsored by the US government through the US Department of State. Here in the US, it is administered by the Institute of International Education, whereas overseas, the program is administered by Fulbright commissions or US embassies. These are US government representations abroad. So it's important, you know, the reason I mentioned these different partners is because they're all involved in the Fulbright uh, program application, selection and decision-making. And then ultimately, if you're selected, you would be working with one of these partner organizations in the country. So think about the diversity and inclusion because it's very important. It's a priority for the Fulbright program. So in this case, for example, with Northwestern University, it is considered an underrepresented institution in the Fulbright program. So you will build in that diversity and inclusion element uh, for the Fulbright program. So make sure you use this to your benefit. Of course, applications are reviewed for quality and you know, they're reviewed for every single aspect and component that we require, but being underrepresented in the Fulbright program, if we want to hear about that, the reviewers want to hear about that because they want to raise the profile of the Fulbright program in your institution, specifically about the Fulbright US Scholar Program. So you see uh, since uh, 1946, how large the program has grown. Um, and just for the Fulbright US Scholar Program, we send approximately 900 US scholars abroad and administrators. So then we do host that many international scholars. We send Fulbright US students. We host international students, uh, Fulbright language teaching assistants, et cetera. So overall 8,000 people worldwide, including the US and international, scholars and students participate in the Fulbright program. And up to date, we have approximately 400,000 participants. So almost half a million people uh, worldwide have attended the Fulbright program, which is like amazing. And think about why do you wanna to apply to Fulbright? Because we I, we're going to hear great stories from the previous Fulbrighters here today, I'm sure, but it is considered a transformational experience because the idea is for you to benefit from this experience, both professionally and personally. You're going to make lifelong lasting friends that you know these connections are real and true and everlasting. And then it expands your um, publishing network if you are into that. And then you just become more multicultural in the classroom. Your students benefit, your colleagues, the, the university, your home institution. Um, you will always be recognized as a Fulbright scholar. So, you know, I've seen this, that people use that on their resume and they're very proud of their Fulbright experience. So they wanna make sure that everybody else, you know, knows about this unique opportunity. It is also considered a very family friendly program because um, about 60% of our opportunities offer dependent support. So not every country will do this, but as you've seen, as you can see, 60% are offering support. So you think about if you want to bring your spouses or your um, family members. 
it is also considered a very supportive program because we at IIE work closely with applicants. So we just did a recent lab applicant survey and we found out that 70% of those applicants have worked closely with us on their application process. We understand it's a bit overwhelming maybe, but there are many moving parts, but it's all doable because you have the resources and support to do this. So now let's just talk about the eligibility because like I said, US citizenship is required. And then every country has different dynamics. So some countries are welcoming only PhD scholars. Um, other countries are open to scholars who have master degree or substantial experience. So first of all, think about, you know, look at these um, awards and you can filter them. I'm gonna show you if we have some time how to look for these opportunities that, you know, would match your, your skills and experience. We do have opportunities also for artists and independent scholars and for non-academics as well. And uh, if you've had a Fulbright before, you just need to wait two years <clears throat> before you're eligible to apply for another Fulbright. So there, you know, you need to justify, well, why do you need another Fulbright? But it's all doable. We've seen people, you know, have their Fulbrights for three or four times. So there's no limit to how many Fulbrights you can get. There are four types of Fulbright Scholar Awards. So the first one, the Scholar Award, which is the predominant type. And um, this is welcoming applicants from early career to senior level of scholars. So all in between. And then there are just postdoc opportunities. So as long as applicants have their PhD by February of 23, they are eligible to apply. Exception is in Spain, because of course it's Spain, they have to have exceptions, <laughs> but they will welcome uh, postdoc candidates as long as they have their PhD by June of next year. So um, they do have amazing opportunities also for distinguished scholars. And this is more for senior level of scholars, those who have at least 13 years of teaching and, and research experience. We do have the International Education Administrator Awards or seminars. So these are two week seminars for applicants, candidates who work in international study offices, and who are interested to go and make these connections with colleagues abroad. We also offer the flex option. This is an opportunity to do multiple visits within the span of two years. So you don't have to take sabbatical. You can go for a month and just you know, stretch this within two years and go back and forth. Travel is funded. For this one in particular, for the flex option, they do not support the dependents because it's a lot of travel. So it doesn't make sense. And how do you select the right award? So you wanna make sure you select first the country. You wanna identify a country where you're so passionate about going, you're, it, it intrigues you, the culture that they have, the, you know, the way they teach, the curriculum they have at this host institution. Because keep in mind, every application is country specific. So you are building a rationale and a justification to why do you need to go to a particular country um, and you have to convince the reviewers that this project will only make sense in this country. So it cannot be like a universal application. Language is not required in majority of these uh, opportunities, but whenever it is required, it is stated clearly and um, you just wanna have that into consideration. But I always encourage applicants to look at the discipline prefer preferences. Some awards have like for example, in media and journalism, we do have like some recent awards that they prefer applicants and they are only welcome applicants in that discipline or STEM disciplines or, you know. So look at those awards first because then you're just competing with candidates within that discipline. Whereas we have these old discipline awards which are open-ended and then you're competing with applicants in all different kind of disciplines and fields. It's important to justify why do you need to do this project in that country, how they would benefit from you as an expert, and in the long run, also how will Northwestern University benefit from this experience. So um, here's how to understand the awards, but I'm going to show you our website live. So I'll just leave this for later. And I'm going to just briefly mention here the application components because once you've decided what award you want to apply, what country you want to apply to, then you just dive deep into the 
application process. We have an online application. It's very user-friendly. So once you start your application, even within the online application, we do have instructions. So you can follow step-by-step step what is required to complete your successful application. So these are just the components of the application. And we do have guidance and prompt questions for every component. Like project statement is the backbone of your application where you explain why, how, who, et cetera. So all the questions, why do you need a Fulbright? Why do you need to leave the US and go to this country to do this work? You know, you, you are pitching this idea as part of your application. So project statement is where this is captured and your resume, letters of recommendations, um, et cetera. So letter of invitation is also another important component where in, uh, when it is required, you need to get the letter of invitation. You must in order for your application to be eligible. In many cases, some countries just specify the letter is either optional or preferred. I would still encourage you to get the letter if possible. Only when it, they say the letter should not be sought, then you don't need the letter. And we do have guidance on what the letter should look like and who should write the letter. I mean, there are no strict rules, but generally you wanna to speak to a colleague abroad that you're planning to do this Fulbright project to see like who is the best person to issue this letter of invitation and they address it to you and then you just upload it to your application. Additional materials, if you're applying for teaching, the syllabi is required. And if you're applying for research bibliography related to that research is required. If you are in the arts or creative writing, architecture, portfolio is also required to be part of your application. Here are just some of the tips how to submit a strong application. So every country, like I said, has different specifics and different parameters. So you wanna make sure you go through the award description for each country, take some time to read them, and then if you have any questions, we have a dedicated staff member for every award. So make sure you reach out to us. Do not hesitate. As part of the Fulbright application, the more people you reach out to connect with people in the country, with us at IIE, with your school, with alumni, the chances are that your application is gonna be stronger because th that's the idea of the Fulbright. You connect with people even during the application process, you get their feedback, especially if you can get connected to the people in the country, then just, you know, you're going to be more culturally um, sensitive about what's happening in that country. And then you want to also make sure you know what's happening in the country in terms of the research, if you're proposing research or teaching. So how will you then enrich their curriculum or their advance their research? Please take advantage of the IIE resources because we do provide so many webinars, office hours, and you can even schedule advising calls with us and we will be happy to answer any question you might have. You also are required to have two letters of recommendation. So one should come from your home institution and the second letter should come from a colleague outside your home institution. Here's the timeline. So the, we are accepting applications just as a reminder for the academic year 2023, 2024. The deadline is September 15, and you can only apply to one award per competition. After you submit your application, we do conduct technical reviews of your applications. We wanna make sure that you're not missing a component, like a letter of invitation or any other component, and then we'll reach out again to you to give you a second chance. But please <laughs> do not, you know, if you uh, are missing, uh, especially the letter of invitation, we have time until after the deadline to receive your letter of invitation. But if you're missing a letter of recommendation or your syllabi or things you can do by the application, please make sure that you complete those. Then there is a USP review, colleagues in your discipline or close to your discipline will get together and review applications and they will make recommendations or non-recommendations for applications to either move forward or not. So uh, this happens between uh, October and November. And certainly before Christmas, you will learn whether you pass this first stage or not. So for those applicants who pass the first stage, then these applications are processed further in the hosting countries. And then they make the final determination or final recommendation 
whether these applications should be selected or not. So you will hear between January and June of next year, whether you have been recommended or selected or not. So it's a lot of waiting time after you submit your application, but you know, just keep in mind that this is a competition and it's, um, you know, they wanna make sure they select the best from the best. So they take some time and every country has different dynamic. So some work faster than the others, but all in all, before June of next year, you would learn if you're selected, if you apply for this competition cycle. So we do have also a Fulbright Alumni Ambassador Program. These are um, selected alumni who apply to become alumni ambassadors, and then uh, they become the voice of the Fulbright Program. So they participate in advocacy, uh, at the Hill, so they represent the program in various campuses. They do what I'm doing currently now, just connecting with their colleagues, making sure to encourage them and inspire them to, to apply for a Fulbright. And I know we, I received some questions uh, about um, how to bring foreign Fulbrighters in your campus. So this is more for the institution, or maybe uh, more for Annalise and the staff here, but uh, there is the Fulbright Scholar in Residence program. Um, the deadline is on June 1st. So we have my colleagues who work on this program. Basically you apply to host a foreign visiting scholar. Um, if you don't have a good representation of the visiting or foreign visiting scholars in your campus. So there is an application process and you apply to IIE and then IIE selects a visiting scholar if you're selected. There's also the Fulbright Outreach Lecturing Fund, the current visiting Fulbrighters who are from uh, various countries visiting in the US, you can invite them to host them here for a week for a workshop or a seminar or lectures. So uh, there's no deadline for this, but at least um, you know, you need to apply at least one month before. And we do have a list of those current visiting Fulbrighters on our scholar directory, and you can just pick from them and um, you can invite them. Fulbright Language Teaching Assistant Program, I believe you have uh, been hosting them. So these are great teachers who will, you know, talk to students um, and enhance the students' understanding of different languages and cultures. There's so many different Fulbright programs. I don't want to overwhelm you, but just so you can, you know, you're aware of, of them here. So you should stay connected with Fulbright if you're planning to apply. So you can always email us scholars at IIE.org if you have a general question. Uh, you can visit our website, cis.org. You can refer your colleagues, but also if you have social media or active on social media, you can follow us. Because Fulbright always features uh, current Fulbrighters or alumni. They have great stories, great pictures, mostly Fulbright year students. But um, we do have a uh, great presence in all of these four uh, different uh, social media platforms. All right, so then in the end, if we have some time, I'm gonna show you our website. But for now, um, that would be all for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for receiving your applications. That's so helpful. Please have a seat. Thank you so much, Aphrodita, for giving us that um, great overview of such a vast program. There's a lot to cover there. Um, so now we're going to hear from a few of our uh, Northwestern Fulbright alumni. Um, and we have with us in person, Katrina DeBoard, who is uh, right here at Buffett, Assistant Director of Operations and Development in our Global Learning Office at Buffett. She was a Fulbright International Education Administrator awardee in Germany. And to my left is uh, Professor Francesca Duncan, who's an assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology in Feinberg School of Medicine. And she was a Fulbright scholar in Spain. And online, maybe we can pull him up. Um, we have Professor Jordan Gans Morse, who is an associate professor of political science in the Weinberg College of arts and sciences, and he was a Fulbright scholar in Ukraine. So first of all, thank you to all of you for joining us today. Really appreciate you being here. Um, so um, um, I just uh, would like maybe for you each, we'll have a chance for, for folks to ask you questions, but just to sort of 
uh, kick things off, if you could just share a little bit about what your experience was like, why you chose to do the program, maybe what were some of the highs and lows, and um, how it's impacted your work in the long run. And maybe Jordan, if, since you're here, can you hear us? Yes? Yes? Okay. Since we what, always might lose you um, with the virtual, I wonder if we could start with you. Is that okay? Sure. Oh, happy to. So, so tell us a little bit about your experience in as a Fulbright in Ukraine. Yeah, so I was in Ukraine for the 2016-17 academic year, and uh, prior to that point, I had spent a lot of time in Russia um, for going back to the, the you know late 1990s. And I switched to looking at Ukraine for a number of reasons, in part because uh, just out of curiosity and wanting to do something new, um, and in part because um, a lot of the types of research I was doing were getting difficult in Russia, and in part because Ukraine had had a lot of very interesting political, well, I'm a political scientist, and then and, uh, Ukraine had a lot of interesting political phenomena happening ever since the 2014 uh, Revolution of Dignity, and so um, it was it was an exciting place to be in terms of social movements, in terms of anti-corruption movements, in terms of all sorts of reforms to the government, um, and so I was based in Kiev, uh, in Kiev, and uh, at the Kiev Mohila Academy. And from there, I did research, you know, in, in pretty much all the, the major uh, cities of, of Ukraine, the, the largest cities, at least some of the largest cities, so Kharkiv in the east, and Odessa in the south, and Lviv in the, in the west, and was doing interviews with anti-corruption activists and with government officials of different types, ranging from judges to different types of bureaucrats, um, asking about things in terms of what motivated them to join governments, how they're dealing with corruption, how the reforms have impacted them, and things like this. Um, I also was on the, the type of Fulbright we do a, a mix of teaching and, and, and research, but um, the amount of teaching I did was for various reasons fairly minimal, but I taught a course there about uh, fighting corruption uh, to master students at Kiev Mahill Academy. So that was kind of the brief overview. I'm happy to say more if there's questions or if there's anything else I can add. Wow, and can, um, can you say a couple words, Jordan, about how that year has uh, shaped your research trajectory today? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> I would say I didn't expect there to be a full-blown war between Russia and Ukraine um, when I spent time there. Uh, and, you know, I, I knew I was going to shift a, a decent portion of my research, research to Ukraine from away from Russia at the time. Um, and, and, you know, since then, I'd say I've kind of been doing about half my research in Russia and about half in Ukraine, but much more of the Russian research has been either with Russian colleagues who could get data without me you know, personally having to be there to, to do it, um, or uh, in you know, administrative data and other things that we could scrape from the web or that we could get um, in, in ways without directly asking people. Um, whereas Ukraine has been just much more open for, for a number of reasons um, that are probably mostly obvious. Um, and then now with the war, everything's, I mean, Ukraine's really moved to the front uh, for me for just about everything. Um, and so there's, uh, I, I don't know what the right adjective is. I, fortuitous would be the wrong word because it's not exactly a place that's, um, um, you know, it, it, for those of us who have connections to Ukraine, it's, it's a painful and difficult thing to watch. But on the other hand, uh, I've certainly, um, if I'd been someone who had just been working on Russia prior to this war, I'd have an extremely different perspective on it. And so I'm definitely grateful that I you know, know the Ukrainians that I know, that I have experiences on the ground in Ukraine uh, before the war. Um, and so that there's a, you know, a type of connection there that, that's just extremely different that you can't get you know, any other way than spending time in a country. Um, and in particular, you know, I'm a big believer in, in, in you know, political science is maybe unique to our discipline, but you know, there's, there's lots of debates about kind of how much time someone needs to spend on the ground to do the type of research they do. And, and I'm a believer that you can get information without being on the ground now in today's world. Things have changed a lot, um, especially during COVID, but you can only really understand it if you spent some significant time in the country at some point. And um, since I, you know, I had that in Russia, you know, for many years, I'm confident getting data out of Russia and doing things with it. Um, but without having first done that in Ukraine at some point, I would really not feel comfortable publishing things I do and, and saying things about Ukraine uh, without that, that context that you have from having spent time there. And then also having the connections that you make when you're there to run things by actual people from that country and say, does, you know, does this make sense? Do I sound too much like a foreigner? Um, does this, you know, have some actual on the ground logic and so on? So in all those ways, it's, it's had a huge impact on, on all the research I do now. That's fantastic. You're such a thought leader on our campus on these issues. And uh, hearing you talk about your Fulbright, I can see that a lot of that expertise traces back to this scholarship, this fellowship. So that's fantastic. Um, maybe Francesca, I could just turn to you. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience? Sure. Um, 
Thank you so much for this opportunity um, to be here and share my experiences. So I fell into this program in a little bit of serendipity. So I um, was an assistant professor in OBGYN and we were starting a master's program in reproductive science and medicine about 2016. And I got an email from a colleague of mine who was at Spain saying that they have this Fulbright um, opportunity to basically be embedded in their master's program in reproductive science that had been around for about 15 years. And it was a three month opportunity. And I thought, wow, how cool would it be to, you know, be able to go to another country and learn firsthand from a program that has been in existence for so long. And as a side note, um, my, my parents met when my dad was a Fulbright scholar um, in Italy. And so I was always really intrigued. I was like literally a product of a Fulbright. And so I wanted to better understand what is this? Um, and so I was super excited about it. And it turned out it was a really good sort of moment in my career. Um, so that's another long sort of conversation that I won't get into, but it was this really time where I did have this three months that I could dedicate um, and sort of devote to academic scholarship in another country. So I applied um, for the, the Fulbright and received it. Um, and I went and participated. So it's the University of Murcia in Spain in their veterinary school in their master's program in um, the biology and technology of mammalian reproduction. So when I was there, I really did kind of three things. One is I taught um, in their program. So there with the language issue, um, basically you didn't have to know Spanish, but they would like it if you had some background. And I figured I had Italian background, which was close enough, which I realized wasn't really close enough, but um, the, the program was taught in English and the students um, spoke in English. And this was actually a really interesting thing to have uh, the students sort of forced them out of their comfort zone to, to have to speak in English to someone. Um, so I taught several classes on histology, um, bioengineering and reproduction, bringing our expertise from Northwestern um, over there. I also um, learned about their program. So how do you set up a master's program that has been in existence from the didactic coursework to the laboratory um, to various aspects of their externships? Um, I shared with them what we do at our program or what we were planning to do, but also our Center for Reproductive um, Science. And then the other opportunity that I had was not just teaching. So they're in a veterinary school and they do a tremendous amount of reproductive science uh, research in large animal species, which we don't have on our campus. So they do a lot of work with um, obviously pork, um, porcine, so pig um, and cow. So I was able to start a lot, learn a lot about how to do research, which with those model organisms um, and start research programs which or research projects, which have then continued. Um, the other major goal was to embed myself in a different culture. And that was really awesome of learning how to navigate living in another country, um, you know, in a different language, all of the different sort of timetables, you know, they eat dinner really, really late at night. And that was a really different thing, but just sort of embedding yourself in the everyday life um, and learning the culture, um, what was important to them, and then also bringing our culture to them. And this was really fun. So this was in the fall. And so obviously we have Halloween and Thanksgiving. Um, and I actually had to come back um, in between the visit, like for once, and I came right down for around Halloween. And so I went back with all sorts of pumpkin spice um, stuff um, and brought that back. And then the other thing was, um, for me, Thanksgiving is really important. And there hadn't been one Thanksgiving in my life that I missed. And I was absolutely determined that I was going to have Thanksgiving in Spain. So that was a really awesome experience of trying to find a turkey, um, trying to find cranberries. I think I spent like $30 on cranberries. So I was like, we're going to have cranberry sauce. But we did this whole, um, we brought this turkey, um, we brought it to a bakery um, because that was the only place that had ovens big enough to put a turkey. Um, but anyway, so this is this whole experience and we um, engaged the, the group there to you know print out um, classic Thanksgiving recipes and have them try to interpret them and make them. And we had this whole Thanksgiving banquet um, and we talk about that every year. So, you know, that culture, like really embedding and exchanging ideas. And I just wanted to sort of echo in terms of what has this meant in terms of now? Um, and your point about this is long lasting. I cannot underscore like how three months has transformed into a lifetime. Um, so just to give you some examples, one of the faculty members who I had started collaborating with research, she actually came to Northwestern in 2019, not through a Fulbright, but just as a visiting scholarship. Um, and she re did research in my lab. And so we've been working together, you know, in terms of publishing, we've been publishing, we've been co-mentoring students abstracts at professional meetings. 
The other thing is we have a really tight partnership with their master's program and our master's program. So every year we host a virtual journal club where the students interact um, with each other. We've published in the academic literature about these types of events. Um, and we actually just published, it just got accepted, um, basically a review of our programs, like a parallel uh, review of the success of our programs over the, the, the life history. So we have the Spain and Northwestern group. So that's been really awesome. And then I'll say that every year they have Fulbrights who go into their program like I did. And, but they're from the US. And so we have like a group of us um, that basically are the Fulbrighters who went to Spain. And so we are very close too. And so we have like a WhatsApp group and we're always um, communicating. So yeah, it's something where I just think that I never imagined the longevity of how three months could turn into something that was just such a, a strong um, relationship. So that's um, my experience. And I think one of the questions was like, what would you advise um, anyone at Northwestern who's interested in doing it? Which is, I highly recommend doing it. <laughs> um, if you have any sort of thought that this is in your mind, I would definitely go for it. Um, because again, it might seem like a lot of time. I don't know if all of the programs, if they have various lengths, um, but yeah, so mine was three months, which was sort of a perfect time. And, you know, you might say three months isn't enough time, but I actually thought it was a perfect amount of time to learn how to live in a culture by yourself on your own where you're not relying on other people, um, but making these relationships that then last well beyond three months. That's incredible. Aphrodita, I think she should be one of your ambassadors. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I encourage you. That's great. Thank you so much. Incredible story. So Katrina, I'm so glad you're here because I think many people don't realize that this opportunity is also available to international administrators. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience? Yes, thank you for having me. And I was actually one of those people who didn't realize there was an administrator grant initially. Uh, I had been working with Fulbright since 2005 as a Fulbright program advisor and also as a, the head of our campus committee at my former institution. And so I was pretty frequently advising faculty and students on, how, on the process of the, these various Fulbright programs. And then it wasn't until I, I transitioned here to Northwestern when I realized there was an administrator grant as well. Um, and a primary difference of this grant with it, uh, compared to the other scholar grants is that it's just two weeks or in, in duration which means it's, it's feasible for administrators who may not have the flexibility to go for even three months. Um, and so it was a really amazing experience for me. The, I would say the main aim is really to familiarize participants um, or awardees with the local culture, um, country, community, and their education systems so that we can better facilitate uh, mutual exchange uh, between the countries. And um, the as we were discussing, each location has quite different um, requirements and wants of its, of its applicants. And the German cohort was actually looking for a wide variety of administrators. And so it was quite interesting. Um, I was one of a few international educators, but there were also folks from advancement and development offices, career service offices, student support offices, academic affairs offices. And so it was a nice wide variety of, of administrators which made for really rich conversations on site. Um, the, the, um, I would say some of the highs and lows, um, highs, all of it. Um, it. It was really just amazing. The, the amount of work and thought and energy that goes into developing the schedule for the administrators is, is pretty amazing. If anyone works in programming, I mean, two weeks, two weeks of programming that went all across Germany, um, and in some cases went into France for parts of it, uh, broke administrators into subgroups by, um, by function, so that we could go and speak to different administrators at different institutions. Uh, so we, we were based in Berlin, but then also moved to Frankfurt and Bonn, and I think Hamburg as well, parts of the group. So it was a really, really unique experience. Um, and, and the schedule included meetings with folks from different academic units at various institutions there, but also meetings with governmental um, partners, uh, cultural organizations, guest lectures from, from businesses, local businesses, 
uh, and then also a lot of seminars and workshops and just cultural interactions that allowed us to meet and get to know some of our, our partners locally. In terms of how it's impacted my work, I think it's it's just been it's been amazing. Um, the the ability to spend two weeks learning about the German education system uh, really has allowed me, I think, to become a, a better international educator, um, a, a better program manager, and a better advisor to students who are students or or faculty and staff who are who are doing work in the area. Um, and I, I would reiterate what others have said. I've maintained this network. So I went in 2017. Next week, I'll be going to NAFSA, which is a conference for international educators, and I'll be meeting with my 2017 cohort um, to catch up and connect. Yeah, we've also, we've co-presented, we've um, written some articles about the experience, and, and it, it's just amazing to have built that network both here in the US, but also in Germany. We, we all stay in contact. Um, so still in contact with the German Commission in, in Berlin as well. And then advice to other applicants, um, most of this has already been said, but I would just reiterate, take advantage of all of the amazing resources that Fulbright um, and the various organizations have available. The, the website, um, I think it would be great if you, if you do have the chance to go through it, because they, they give you so much information about exactly what they want to hear, what, what content they're looking for in your application. Uh, they also host webinars, um, can connect you with alums, and so there's a lot of resources to help you build a strong application. And I think um, the other thing I would say is really paying attention to the country specifics. So at least in, in, um, at my time, what they were looking for in Germany was very different from what they were looking for for France and was very different from what they were looking for for Japan. And so really making sure you take the time to look at those country specifics, I think is, is um, important. You're giving me goosebumps. This is so exciting. I hope that we have many more of our amazing international administrators at Northwestern who can follow your lead here. This is really great. So we talked about the website. Could yeah. you give us a quick and dirty tour? Okay, so let's see. Um, let's speak here. All right, so. Is it sharing? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So actually we do have a new website that launched today. So this is the exclusive <laughs> for this audience. And I, I'm gonna ask Samantha if you take pictures while I'm showing. My team wants to know how do you like it? And they, a proof that I am showing you, this is our new website, fullbytescholars.org. So, this is, we simplified, previously it was cis.org, but now we want to, you know, have a catchy name. So this is where you go first and bear with me because this is a new website. I'm still also learning, but um, what we, you know, what I want to show you as highlights, basically here now we have um, information about what is the program, what we do, you know, what for by stands apart, et cetera. So you want to take some time to go through that. But what's most importantly, you want to go here. This is the first stop for Fulbright's U.S. Scholar Program. So let's scroll down. Oops. Now this is touchy, sensitive. Okay. So so you want to go here. Fulbright U.S. Scholar Awards. This is the program, one of the largest program of the Fulbright um, categories or Fulbright family. So you want to look under the Fulbright Scholar Awards. And here you will have the catalog of awards. And again, this is a new website, totally new look. And um, it should be pretty, pretty user-friendly. You can use these filters on the side. You can just type in maybe here your discipline if you're interested. Or if you wanna just you know dive deeper and look at opportunities in a region, because the Fulbright US Scholar Program is represented in all of the world regions. So you can filter for that. Um, and then you can filter for a specific country. We do have a drop down list of all um, the 130 countries that are represented as part of the Fulbright. Let me just scroll down here. You can filter for disciplines. We do have 69 disciplines represented in the Fulbright program. 
and you can filter for the award type. So like I mentioned earlier, there are four types of the Fulbright US Scholar Awards. And um, this one is like the most popular. So if I unclick this one, it should show all the opportunities. We have about 411 awards. You can uh, filter for the, oops, the activity type and uh, for the award length, um, for the degree requirements and for invitation, letter of invitation requirement, and lastly, for your career profile. So then once, oops, once you do that, um, but first I wanna just open this first award we have in Albania because these are listed alphabetically. So this award is about media literacy education. So if you do work in media, literacy education, and then every award will have different specifics, like it was mentioned earlier, every country have different requirements. So you wanna pay close attention to, first of all, the application deadline is September 15. Um, then you wanna look at the activity type. Uh, so they're welcoming non-academics and you can do a professional project. So that's what in the Fulbright terminology, uh, professional project, I don't know if everybody can hear me. I forgot to be close to the mic. Um, the professional project means basically if you're non-academic, you can do a non-academic project, uh, like serve as a consultant and etc. We do have like specifics for that. And you can do teaching. So PhD is not required. They're welcoming uh, early career to mid-career academics plus professionals, non-academics, and one person will be selected. So then you wanna pay close attention to the, how long is this award for? Um, so this is uh, for four months or five months or six months. So you can start uh, the project between these months, between October to January. And they do not offer the flex option and they do not offer the multi-country award. So these are the specifics. Now, when you scroll down, you will learn about more specifics, what you're expected to do so that you can propose this in your application. So you will advise mentor students, advise assistant faculty, uh, curriculum development, etc. Then further scrolling down more specific, this is a partnership award with Albanian Media Institute. So you can only propose uh, to do a project with this institute. So you want to get to know this partner. You want to like go on their website. We do provide their websites and all the resources, the contact people. Now you will see that some countries are more resourceful than others. So you want to try to use these resources and just reach out to people. Most of the cases, applicants probably have never met these people. And in many cases have never traveled to the country and you're not expected to have you know, have a deep knowledge or extensive experience in the country. So make these connections as part of your application, send them your resume, pitch your idea. So you wanna gauge their interest. All right, so very, a lot of information here. So under location, you will see, uh, like I mentioned, this is the uh, host institution. Many awards will say, uh, specifically the old discipline awards under location, they will say, any institution of higher education in the country. So as long as you know it's not a for-profit organization, it could be a museum, non-governmental, et cetera, specifically university or research center. But as long as it's a local institution, it's not international, like a UN agency or something, because you know, the idea is for you to build these like we heard, long lasting connections and people who work for the UN usually come and go. So you want to build capacity with local experts. So this award in particular, so again, Albania is fascinating because they do provide a lot of information and um, areas of interest. And uh, the Fulbright program in Albania and majority of the countries worldwide, the Fulbright program is managed by US embassies. This, these are US government representations abroad and I used to work for such an organization before working for IIE. So make sure you go to their website because they have updated and impartial information about the country, political, educational, everything what's going on. There is a dedicated staff member. These are usually US diplomats 
that work with these local organizations and then they update information because you know US embassies primarily role is to serve there for Americans who are living in the country, but also for those who are planning to visit that country. And they also make the final recommendations and final decisions. If you pass the first stage, then the second stage where the program is managed by US Embassy, they will review your application. So you wanna get familiar with the priorities of the US government for every country are different. So some are focusing, like in Albania, we've seen media literacy because media in Albania and in the Balkans in general is a big deal. It's a you know, very profitable industry. So that's why they wanna make sure it's a lot of you know, fake news circulating. So that's why they wanna make sure that they have a US expert to work with these media institutions to you know, make sure they follow the standards. So, and this is just one of the awards, you know, one of the 408 awards. So every award page will have this option to join an office hour and you can join an office hour. We do host them for Europe and Eurasia every Monday. So it's weekly. And these are live questions and answers. You can just join, listen in, or ask your question. And you can register for a webinar. And for every award, we do have, like I said, a dedicated staff member that the name will be listed here. But for now, since today's the launch, <laughs> We don't have that, but it, it, this is being updated. But this is again, just a preview for you to, to see what the website is gonna look like. Then when you decide, let's say you wanna apply to this country, then you wanna use the, you wanna look at the award requirements. Um, you wanna look at the, you know, whether they accept applicants with dual citizens citizenship. Because many countries will not mind if you're a dual citizen, but a priority will be given to those who do not have extensive experience in those countries. But sometimes they will specify, like Spain doesn't want both US and Spanish citizens to apply because you know it makes sense because this is a growth opportunity. They wanna give opportunity for you. It's much better to explore new territory, new country. Um, and then that's how you grow professionally and personally. The award benefits um, here will state the stipends, the benefits, whether they support your family members, etc. And the last tab here is the country area overview. Okay, so, um, and then you begin the application process. This should take you to this part of our website where it's from A to Z, what is required for every component, what you need to, um, put in together and what questions you need to answer in order to address everything that is required, including the formatting. Okay, I'll stop here. And then if there are any questions, I, I see some questions here on the chat box. Fantastic. Okay, yeah. great. All right, so uh, thank you for that. So now we have time for some questions, either for Aphrodita or for Katrina or Francesca or Jordan. So if you're here, just raise your hand, we'll bring a mic to you. And those of you online, um, I, the, Samantha will bring the questions to me. So, so anybody? Yeah. Oh, hi, thank you for doing this. Uh, I have a, just a general question about like how many people apply usually for each role. Is it like in the hundreds? Is it in the thousands? Like how competitive is, yeah, is usually each project? Thank you. That's a great question, a very common question, but unfortunately we cannot share the statistics. Um, we do have the Fulbright Scholar Director, I didn't get to that, but um, this is scholars who have applied until last year and who have done their grants until last year. But for current competition, we don't share the statistics. But I can tell you that usually, typically, more developed countries, and I can speak for Europe and Eurasia because that's where I work day to day, and usually the more developed countries, like English speaking countries, the UK and you know, all these developed countries, Spain, Germany, others are more competitive compared to the like Central Europe, Eastern Europe, just because you know, um, they overlook these countries, but they do offer amazing opportunities. And I would strongly suggest that you consider these smaller countries where your impact could be greater 
where there is not a lot going on, a lot, not a lot of academic relation between, you know, the scholars in, from the U.S. and these scholars. And also, all discipline awards are always more competitive considering compared to the discipline pref preferred awards or like um, partnership awards. So if you see a specific university that is offering that Fulbright, please note that that is not as competitive as the old discipline, just because the old discipline welcomes applicants from all disciplines can host, can uh, collaborate with any host in the country. Thank you. Okay, we've got a great question online. Um, somebody says, I'm interested in a Fulbright Scholar Award and it requires an invitation letter. Can the panelists who applied to an award requiring an invitation letter talk about how they approach this process? Did you need an invitation letter? Um, so yes, I had an invitation letter, um, but there they were looking for, again, they have a slot every year that they're recruiting, trying to get Fulbrights in. So they had an invitation letter sort of set up that outlined um, what they were, you know, we worked together because we wanted to have both the teaching component and the research component. So they knew they wanted to have someone embedded in their master's program who could teach um, but then we tailored it to specifically what I would be teaching. And then the research project was something that we um, worked together on. So I think, you know, there's this talking about sort of establishing relationships with the institution or the individuals that you're working with beforehand so that you can make it um, very tailored. I think, I mean, again, I don't know if it worked for me, um, but it was a very tailored invitation letter. How did you come to be in touch with the folks in the first place? So it was that, for me, it was this uh, individual who I had worked with um, as a, he was a student in a class that I taught and he was faculty at this institution. So it was a personal connection there. Um, Jordan, are you still there? Is Jordan still there? Yep. Yeah, did you have to have an invitation letter? I did, um, and I can't recall exactly how I was put in touch with the right people, but it was either that I reached out just to my own uh, connections in terms of people who I knew had spent time in Ukraine and asked uh, which universities are best for hosting full by scholars and who would be the right people to contact. Um, or if I if I just um, once I knew which universities uh, found the right offices and, and wrote them. But ultimately, once I knew I wanted to be at Kiev Mihila, um, I somehow, I, again, I don't recall exactly, but I knew which office it was at an office of like international relations or something like that, uh, that, that deals specifically in these types of issues of arranging visiting scholars, scholars uh, positions and, and writing these letters. And I think it's probably true in, in most countries is that uh, if you know, if you find the right university that they're gonna wanna host Fulbright scholars and they've done this before. Um, and one other way to do it too, I don't believe this is what I did, but you know, if you really don't have context with the country you're going to, uh, just finding the names of previous Fulbrighters from that country and writing them, um, I mean, people are really, really willing to help out and finding out uh, which you know universities they're at and why they chose to be there and who the right contact people are. And then once you just write a, an email saying, I'm applying for the Fulbright, I'm so-and-so, um, you know, would you be willing to host me? And if so, would you be willing to provide a letter? They almost always have the, the template letters ready and everything. That's really good advice. Do you have any other advice on this question? Yes, so um, in getting the letter of invitation, we also have guidance how to approach people and what should the letter of invitation include. So um, typically, like I showed you, the award for Albania would have that institution in Albania. And then uh, under the award, uh, we also have the contacts, like the emails. Whenever it's a partnership award, you would have the email address for that person. And if there is no email, like it's an open-ended, like in Germany, there is like any institution of higher education, you would just want to research their websites and find out a colleague that does similar work to what you're doing and then just reach out to them. Fulbright is quite well known for the academia worldwide. So they, they would be happy to connect with you and then, you know, give you some feedback. So basically that's the best way to approach. And also like he mentioned the Fulbright Scholar Directory, we do have this list of previous alumni and then you wanna also connect with the alumni here at Northwestern University so that they you see, you learn from them like just like we learned today about their experience especially if they went to a country that you are interested in applying that helps a lot that's really great advice 
So um, we're um, close to time here, but there's just a couple people I want to introduce before we close. So um, uh, first, I want to introduce Anait Gomtian, who's right here. Could you stand up, Anait, maybe just? So Anait is a senior faculty or honors coordinator in administration, in the Office of Administration and Planning. And she is uh, the person responsible for helping faculty win prizes, basically, at Northwestern. So she has a fun job. And as part of that, um, she is uh, uh, stepping forward to provide administrative support for faculty who want to apply for Fulbrights at Northwestern now. So we're extremely grateful to you, Anait, for doing this. And just, uh, we will be sending everyone who signed up today um, some email information, including Anait's email. But um, if you want some sort of um, hands-on help with this, she would be a fantastic first contact. So thank you for doing this. It's great. <laughs> thank you. Um, I also want to mention that um, if you are a staff member who is interested in following Katrina and doing uh, something similar, um, you could uh, speak to Samantha Hevers over here, who is the lead from North, for Northwestern Buffett, or Kim Rapp in the Office of International Relations, and both um, can uh, direct you and help you with those. Um, um, and I also wanna mention um, that we haven't been talking about this today, but uh, there is a whole series of Fulbrights for students. And uh, Steve Hill, who's right here, is from the Office of Fellowships, and they uh, handle our, our student Fulbright Awards. And I'm just proud to say we are a High perform, highest performing institution on that. So bravo, we're gonna try to compete with you one of these days. So, <laughs> um, so that's great. Um, so, um, so before we close, I know, so today, um, uh, um, uh, Aphrodite has been here meeting individually with folks as well this morning, uh, but um, you do have office hours, right? So if people were not able to meet with you in person today, it's still possible to meet with you virtually in person. Is that right? I'm going to also send a follow-up message uh, with all these great resources and my uh, contact information. I, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have my cards yet, um, but um, I, we will be in touch and definitely, you know, you can schedule advising calls one-on-ones and we can discuss your specific questions and see how, you know, we can help you put together a strong application. And I also want to thank the FPAs who work with the 4 by 2 students uh, program, uh, we are, really appreciate all the work you do with the students because that's a different application process. So it's different wonderful. from the scholar. Absolutely. And, and, on, and yet another different application, I'll say we're also really excited about getting more international Fulbrights to Northwestern. So if you have an interest in having a colleague here as a researcher or a teacher, from another country, we didn't talk about that today, but please feel free to reach out to me or Samantha or anybody else, and we can try to direct you on that as well. Um, for today, I just wanna, first of all, say a huge thank you to you, Aphrodita, for being here. We're thrilled to have you and excited to work together, and this is really helpful. And to my colleagues, um, you're inspiring us and just so grateful for your time and, um, and uh, your, your example. So thank you. Thank you for you all for being here.